number one multicultural channel. This is Tag TV. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. While the political crisis in Sri Lanka is seemingly stabilizing with the new president and a cabinet at the hem of affairs, the island nation continues to grapple with the crippling economic challenges that have severely affected people's lives for weeks. The authorities are reaching out to Beijing seeking support amidst the crisis. Moreover, a section of the society has warned that it will continue to protest against the incumbent authorities for they play the current leadership is just a splinter group of the previous rulers and they won't be any different in ideology and approach in coming times. After a series of protests for over three months owing to the acute economic and humanitarian crisis in the country, Sri Lanka opened its presidential office this week. The government offices have resumed their operations and things appear to be returning to track, at least politically. However, there are still factions who are not pleased with the new arrangements and continue to demonstrate against the new dispensation. The government has launched a crackdown on them and those who were camping on the government land for weeks were raided and forced out. The demonstrators accused the Ranil Vikramasinghe government as no different from the previous Rajapaksa rule as Ranil Vikramasinghe, who won the parliamentary vote, was Rajapaksa's first pick. Protesters say they will continue to express their disappointment even after what they call the government's extreme measures to curb dissent. We are protesting for a just society and we are being attacked brutally and we condemn and say we will continue this protest of love, whatever the attack they are going to give. Even today they might attack us but we will resist and we will face it police and the tri forces commanders ha has to accept the responsibility of this brutal inhuman attack which has been staged on the golf West protest site but we know that main responsible person of this attack is the ranil vikramasinghe Meanwhile, the new Vikramasinghe government has vowed to pull the country out of crisis and says it is constantly working for the same. After the international community urged Chinese to come to the island nation's rescue a week ago, the Sri Lankan administration too has asked Beijing to come and help. Beijing has had billions of dollars of investment in the country and is accused by several observers as the one which is exploiting Sri Lanka. Colombo has asked China to help with trade, investment and tourism to assist it grow sustainably. Colombo said this week that it was in negotiations with Beijing for another loan as the country seeks an emergency $4 billion package to support it emerge from an economic meltdown. A repayment of around close to $1 billion uh, is falling due this year. And we've asked uh, and we've talked to China about the possibility of providing another loan in order to repay these, uh, these sums. And this is still under discussion. We've also uh, uh, requested China uh, for a swap arrangement. The funds will be used essentially to finance imports uh, for Sri Lankan industries, especially our uh, garments industry. Uh, most of the inputs for our garments industry come from China. And the garments industry is a major foreign exchange earner for Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka says Beijing could also help by pouring further investment into vast China-backed port projects in Colombo and Hambantota. Major Chinese investment plans had not materialized because of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Sri Lanka is also seeking a return of tourists in the country as the industry has recorded a massive blow since the COVID outbreak. Sri Lanka also hopes to persuade China to activate a $1.5 billion bilateral currency swap. And while Sri Lanka hopes it would receive some form of assistance from China, Beijing has not been keen enough in providing Colombo the kind of support it seeks and needs. China pledged $500 million of emergency support for Sri Lanka in March, and apart from some support here and there, it hasn't really emerged as an ally. On the other side, neighboring India has been proactive and has assisted Sri Lanka with nearly $4 billion of worth. The government of India has maintained that the assistance will continue to its neighboring nation in coming weeks too. The international community too has put its hope and trust behind New Delhi for it has walked the talk in every single crisis. Moving on. The robust Indian democracy set another example for the world as the tribal women took over this country's president last week. The first tribal and only the second woman in the 75 years of independent Indian history, Draupadi Murumu's election to the top chair is also set to provide a new dimension to the Indian politics. The government of India too stands vindicated after her election as it has always claimed to be working towards the inclusive growth with everybody's contribution. In another exemplary moment for the world, the world's largest democracy, India, has elected a tribal woman for the country's top position, the president. Draupadi Murmu was sworn in as the India's 15th president, becoming the country's first president from a tribal community to assume the highest public office in the world's largest democracy. May, May Draupadi Murmu, Ishwar ki sapat leta ho ki, Ishwar ki sapat leti ho ki, Murmu, a 64-year-old teacher turned politician, will be the second woman to hold the largely ceremonial role as head of the republic. Born into the family of the Santhal tribe from the state of Odisha, Murmu started her career as a school teacher and actively participated in community issues. She later joined mainstream politics and served as BJP state lawmaker in Odisha before becoming governor of the eastern state of Jharkhand. ये हमारे लोकतंत्र की ही शक्ति है कि उसमें एक गरीब घर के पैदा होने बेटी दूर सुदूर आदिवासी क्षेत्र में पैदा हुई बेटी भारत के सर्वोच्च संविधानिक पद तक पहुंच सकती है Her election is seen as the government of India's outreach to country's tribal communities under what has largely been deemed as government's mission of inclusive growth Nearly 8% of India's 1.4 billion population is tribal and any representation from the community is a premier example of functioning of Indian democracy. Observers say it can boost the appeal of Prime Minister Narendra Modi's party among marginalized groups ahead of the 2024 general election. President Murmu, who has dedicated a large chunk of her life to the welfare of tribals, said it was the historic moment for the country as someone from her community too was being recognized and it was a sign that the tribals have become a part of India's mainstream. Mranir Bachchan, this is the truth that you can see in India in India and you can see them too. The government of India और ये मेरे लिए बहुत संतोष की बात है कि जो सदियों से वंचित रहे, जो जीवन विकास के लाभ से दूर रहे, वे गरीब दलित पिछड़े तो था आदिवासी मुझे ये अपना प्रतिबिंब देख सकते हैं। The Indian president acts as supreme commander of the armed forces, but prime minister holds executive powers. The president nevertheless has a key role during the political crisis, such as when a general election is inconclusive by deciding which party is in the best position to form a government. No bill in the Indian system becomes a law until the president ratifies it. 
The president's discretionary powers range from commuting criminal sentences to imposing emergencies if the country finds itself amidst any major political or economic crisis. Moving on, China-Pakistan economic corridor, which was dubbed as a game changer for the country's free-falling economy in 2015, has not just not lived up to its hype, but has severely affected the lives and livelihood of the common people across the country, especially the people of Balochistan, who are carrying out regular demonstrations against what they refer as corrupt nexus of Beijing and Islamabad. The resistance movements have picked momentum with people now realizing that the entire project is nothing more than a Chinese death trap. The small port town of Gwadar in southwest Balochistan is the center stage of the 62 billion USD China Pakistan Economic Corridor Project, or CPEC. Connecting Kashgar in China's Xinjiang province with Gwadar in Pakistan, the 1,864-mile-long CPEC passes through the disputed regions of Gilgit, Baltistan. Officially launched in 2015, this flagship project of Beijing's Belt and Road Initiative was initially lauded as a game-changer for Pakistan's economy. But now, it is in the headlines for all the wrong reasons. The road to completion of the CPEC project has proved long and winding, and it has burdened Islamabad with mountains of debt. Regional experts have contended that CPEC is only advancing Chinese interest in the region, and has in effect alienated people of Gilgit Baltistan and the poor Balochistan province. We have told China that, that Balochistan is an occupied country and Pakistan has no right to sell our ports or our gold or our assets to anybody. So please don't come. But with the entrance of China, the human rights violations, they reached at the level of genocide. Jeopardizing local interests, the CPEC project intends to only benefit China and is therefore facing resistance from the Baloch people. The exploitation of local resources for Beijing's advantage is unbearable for the Baloch, who are already facing atrocities at the hands of the Pakistani security forces. Increasing checkpoints and unlawful fishing by Chinese trawlers in the area have forced locals to protest against the Chinese presence. China has been or fishing in sea pack in Gwadar, the local fishermen who has been fishing for thousands of years by a sustainable way, now they are being stopped because China wants to fish with bigger fish nets. The delay in the completion of the project due to the opposition is sowing frustration among Chinese officials who are questioning Islamabad's ability to complete the work. Now left stranded between external pressure and domestic conflicts, Pakistan has landed in the Chinese debt trap. The project, which has been mired in insufficient transparency, is contributing to an already unsustainable credit load. Originally budgeted for $46 billion, the cost of the CPEC project had risen to $62 billion in 2020. The rapidly increasing investment cost is forcing Islamabad to seek more Chinese loans. The latest economic survey of Pakistan for 2021-2022 has indicated the magnitude of Pakistan's China debt. It revealed that China's mounting debt is increasing sharply and currently standing at 87.7 billion. Pakistan had expected CPEC to promote growth in Pakistan. Instead, it has become a liability for the country. Pakistan is now the world's largest recipient of Chinese grants and assistance. This is the ultimate achievement Islamabad has gained through CPAC. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. Hundreds of supporters of populist Shiite cleric Muqtada al-Sadr broke into Iraq's parliament as the country reached 290 days without a government. In fighting among Shiite and Kurdish groups in particular has prevented the formation of a government, hampering reforms needed as the country struggles to recover from decades of conflict. 
More than nine months since an October election, lawmakers tasked with choosing a president and a prime minister look no closer to an agreement, bringing the country to a record 290 days without a head of state or cabinet. The last longest deadlock was in 2010, when after 289 days, Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki got a second term. The outgoing government of Prime Minister Mustafa al-Kadimi continues to run the country. If parties cannot agree on a new government, Kadimi might stay on as caretaker until new elections can be held. The paralysis has left Iraq without a budget for 2022, holding up spending on much-needed infrastructure projects and economic reform. Israel published images this week, which officials said showed weapons, depots and tunnels in Gaza near a school, a Pepsi factory and other buildings, and accused the Palestinian militant group Hamas of deliberately hiding them in civilian areas. The military's Southern Command released drone footage and coordinates which it said showed tunnels and weapons production sites in densely populated civilian areas, including near Al-Shifa Hospital and the Islamic University of Gaza. Other sites included a UN-run school, a medical clinic, a library and mosques. Hamas, the radical Islamist group, which governs the Gaza Strip, rejected the statement. Gaza, a densely populated strip of land where some 2.3 million people live on a patch of 140 square miles, has been a constant point of conflict ever since Hamas took control of the area in 2007. Israel has fought five conflicts with Gaza since 2009, the most recent an 11-day war in May 2021 when Hamas fired thousands of rockets into Israel and Israel pounded the strip with airstrikes. Israeli military officials said Israel had a joint strategy of supporting economic opportunities for Gazans, including work permits allowing several thousand to work in Israel while maintaining strict military readiness to intervene. Hyper Edo Haku is an application game that explores Edo, the old name of Tokyo City. While exploring the Edo town, one can learn about people's life while looking at the pictures. The pictures that appear in the game are the collection of Edo Tokyo Museum, a popular place for sightseeing in Tokyo. It has released its game application Hyper Edo Haku, which could run on smartphones. Opened around 29 years ago, some of the collections are now displayed at a temporary museum. Hyper Eduhaku stage is around the area of Ryogoku Bridge, which was lively and bustling with many people in the town of Edo. Visitors enjoy going back to the previous era by means of this application. Japanese hospitality is becoming a treat for travelers and citizens all over the world. Renai Australia recently announced a new renewable product technology which is designed to support Australia's clean energy mix future as Renai Global Innovation Manifesto which seeks to achieve zero carbon emissions by 2050. We know that the future of that product development is tied intri intrinsically into Renai Japan's strength, which is electronics and uh, core competencies in uh, software. We think that um, with uh, the great support of Renai Japan's uh, IT and R&D network, Renai Australia will remain a very strong player in this market and regionally as a consequence. Renai Australia contributes to development of renewable energy utilisation around the world.
Moving on. One of the most sacred periods in the Hindu calendar, the month of Sawan, is being observed with great devotion and fanfare across the country. While many are fasting and offering prayers to Hindu Lord Shiva at homes or nearby temples, hundreds of thousands of others have set on pilgrimages to revered Hindu places. Worshipping Lord Shiva in this month is believed to bring peace and good fortune to the devotees. As holy month of Shravan sets in, India's religious landscape descends into a unique fervor of devotion and celebration. Considered one of the most sacred periods in the Hindu calendar, Hindu devotees embark on hundreds of miles long journeys to get a glance of Lord Shiva in this month. Known as Kavar Yatra, a pilgrimage organized by Hindus where the devotees gather to fetch the sacred water of the Ganges River from holy places including Haridwar and Gangotri in Uttarakhand. Millions participate in the holy journey. People make offerings to the God and seek his blessings. As per Hindu scriptures, while Lord Shiva is the Lord of destruction and is known for his anger, he is one of the most generous deities too, who bestows his devotees with overwhelming blessings. Dood chadhaya, panchamrit chadhaya, ganga jal chadhaya, bel patra, bhang, dhatura, phal chadhaya, aur manga bas ashirwad, sarve bhavant sukhine, sarve santuni ramaya, as per the Hindu calendar, Shravan is the fifth month that usually falls in the month of July and August. Devotees also mark this special month by observing fast on every Monday and praying to Lord Shiva and Goddess Parvati for a peaceful and prosperous life. Couples observe this fast for a blissful married life, while unmarried men and women seek the blessings of the Lord and the Goddess for a suitable match. During the entire month of Shravan, Lord Shiva is decorated in different attires and accessories. People who fail to make it to the pilgrimage sites visit their nearby places to observe the piousness of the month. मानते हैं भोले बाबा की महिमा है भोले बाबा का ही सब कुछ है और बाबा सबको बुलाता है सबको साक्षात दर्शन दे सबकी मनोकामना पूर्ण करे यही भोले बाबा से सबके लिए सबका आशीर्वाद है सबका प्यार है हर हर महादेव हर हर महादेव A large participation of people during such festivals reflects their understanding of preserving their culture traditions and rituals The month of Sawan culminates with the festivals of Tej and Raksha Bandhan. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.